want the lights completely on, or is it better to? I think turn, turn the lights, on. turn the lights, turn. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Does that work? Maybe, maybe, maybe do some more, Nick. It's better when it's darker. How do you turn the lights off? Need those off. Alguien domina las luces de esta sala? Alguien domina. Hola. Buenas noches a todos. Eh, bueno, primero dar gracias a Lisaba por eh, permitirnos. Eh, traer gente que nos gusta eh, no voy a ser muy claro y evidente hoy porque llevo un trancazo importante así que soy un poco espeso eh, pero bueno no, lo, deciros un poco que eh, en Vistudio es, eh, es un estudio de Londres eh, que algunos de vosotros ya conoceréis seguro que yo llevo siguiendo mucho tiempo en cierta ocasión alguien me dijo que, que ser bueno una vez es fácil que lo complicado es ser bueno cada vez. Eh, y yo creo que Envy en eso es un ejemplo claro de una trayectoria de probablemente unos 15, 20 años de trabajo constante eh, a un gran nivel, independientemente de si son eh, grandes marcas o pequeñas. Eh, también es la muestra inequívoca que desde un entorno de estudio independiente se puede hacer diseño ambicioso y creo que es un ejemplo para, para muchos de nosotros eh, los que tenemos estudios de diseño gráfico. Eh, me gusta mucho su trabajo y, me, y, y lo sigo y me siento muy halagado porque hayan querido venir a, a visitarnos. So, you didn't understand a word of what no. I just said. Absolutely but, nothing. Um, <laughs> basically, it was all good. good. Um, good. Thanks for coming over and I'll let you guys do it. Thank, Thank you. you. Hola. Um, that's the first and last word, unfortunately, I can say in Spanish. So uh, <laughs> we try and speak very slowly and um, also apologize for bringing the London weather with us. Apparently, it was beautiful in London today. Um, so today, Nick and I are going to show you a little bit about how we work at NB in London um, and show you eight projects, which we're trying not to talk over each other. So let's go okay. for it. I've got no idea what these say, by the way. Just thought they were quite funny English sayings. Okay, so we're, we're called MB. We've been going since 1997, 98. Nick and I first met at a company called Pentagram in London, where we worked on with different partners for a number of years, very similar to, to these guys over here. And at the end of that time, which was like a real apprenticeship for us, we, we felt like we were really unemployable and we had to kind of do it ourselves. And, We've been doing this ever since. Um, so our studio, I don't know if you know London, is just opposite St. Paul's. I have to walk across this Millennium Bridge every day, which is wonderful. And uh, we have an amazing view. And we're right literally just behind Tate Modern. You see there's no rain. <laughs> just, just next to the Globe and Borough Market for lovely food. So it's a really, really lovely little part of, of London that we're in, in the southeast, and it's really changing over there. And, and this is our studio. We've moved around London uh, throughout the years from um, literally on the kitchen table to various other places. And, and this is where we are now. So if you poke your head out the window, you can see the Thames. So we're, we're quite privileged. Um, so this is how we work. This is us, NB, in the big blue circle. And we're graphic designers. We don't pretend to be anybody apart from what we do, graphic design. And um, over the years, what we've learned Is, is all about team playing and about collaboration and, and to build the best people around you. So we have a really strong project management side with us as well. So it's us, project management, and, and a team of designers. And so it's like a little um, conductor, as it were. And for every single project we work on, whether it's retail, education, with the arts, or for the drinks, or, or whatever it is, we try and get the best people around us and form a little team, whether it's the writers, the copywriters, the researchers, image makers, photographers, whatever. 
animators and, um, and we sell ourselves as a, as a little unit and it keeps us fresh, which is great. I don't know why this is doing this, I'm pressing the wrong button. I'm going to hand you over to Nick now and can we see how we can work between each other. Over to you. Hopefully really well. Um, so that diagram you just saw was one of the things we show clients and we change the words in that every now and again. To, but it's about, it's about how we work collaboratively. Um, recent, more recently we've been trying to express to people what we do and so we, uh, Alan and I sat down and wrote what it is we think we do. Um, and we wrote this thing called why and we had this kind of idea around so why do we do what we do for clients so we wrote a script we believe the great ideas yada 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 um, and then because we collaborate we thought well what do we do with this and we pasted it on our website and it it felt like it would be read by nobody nobody would take any notice so we we thought let's make it a little movie and so we asked our friend uh, Johnny Kelly, who's an animator, to come and help us with the little movie. So this, is, this, this started as a little kind of idea, a script, explaining really to clients, more than anything else, what we do and why, why it's of value. Michael Wolf is this guy. Uh, he, he's the wolf of Wolf Ollins in London. Uh, he started Wolf Ollins in the 1840s. I'm kidding. Uh, 19, uh, 1960s, 70s. Um, this, he probably won't like us for showing this image, but this is from him in South Africa when he was doing a talk there. But um, he's famous for doing all sorts of identities for brands, uh, creating all sorts of stuff. And we work with him a bit now because we once wrote him a begging letter. You know, please, Michael, will you come and work with us? And so he's one of our friends, Johnny Kelly, amazing guy. Uh, he joined us as a student just as a graphic designer. Um, little did we know he really wanted to be an animator. Uh, and now he's gone on to win award after award for his kind of animation work. And this is a guy called James Graham. He's the uh, he's an illustrator. And the three of them helped us do our little video. So it started as a conversation. Will you help us? This is probably Johnny's sketchbook, trying to work out how we put this thing together. And we have great ideas. ideas. We believe that great ideas will add value to your business. Great ideas connect with people and can make you stand out from your competition. We believe that great ideas will add value to your business. Great ideas connect with people and can make you stand out from your competition. We think big. The breadth of sectors we work across demands it. We start with an open mind. We can become your customer, your audience, what do you want them to think? How do you want them to feel? What's the story you want to tell? Why should they believe you? There are always lots of questions. We make sure that we ask the right ones. It's an informed approach that makes no assumptions. So that, so that was the start of the conversation, and that was the script that we started with, and we started to get images and we realized that this thing was going to become monotonous, was going to become boring as we did it like this. So we went back to the drawing board with Johnny, uh, uh, the animator. And we then asked our friend Michael to do a voiceover. So he, what was really weird is we, I went with him to uh, a zoo, like a, like a city zoo in uh, Hackney, which is in London. And you went to this little zoo, you went underground into this anechoic chamber, so it's where you do voiceover recording. And I went with this 70, nearly 80 year old man down into this underneath a zoo to record this stuff. And Nick, yes? I'm not sure the breadth of sectors you work in <clears throat> um, is a natural follow on from standing out from your competition. So, but it is and I think thinking big is important. So Michael's quite, quite opinionated. So he kind of helped restructure the script in his own vision. He did. But he helped to us. The he helped us. He, uh, he, he flowed away from the script and came back. Meanwhile, uh, James and Johnny were doing their magic with fantastic illustration, James's illustrations, and Johnny was helping animate them. And so we had all these really curious kind of ideas around what should be what, and we would do brainstorm sessions with them. <coughs> and it was just marvelous. Why us? Because
because we believe that great ideas will add value to your business. Great ideas are usually big ideas, and we learn from all the different people we work for. We work for large corporations, large institutions, small enterprises. And however big or small you are, big thinking and great ideas are what will work. We start with an open mind. Some people think an open mind is an empty mind, and in a way it is. We have to have an empty mind so that we can become your customer, so that we can become the people you want to connect with. What do you want them to think? How do you want them to feel? What's the story you want to tell them? And why should they believe you? We need to have an informed approach. We need to make sure we've made no assumptions. Clear thinking and great ideas are the foundation of what we do. We work hard to bring people solutions that are both appropriate and timeless. Timeless because they need to endure. We pay a disproportionate attention to detail. We think detail is crucial. The reason why is because detail is how people experience great ideas. So why us? Because having great ideas, ideas that satisfy and delight our clients and their customers, is what we're all about. So that was the end result. And, and um, I guess I really, I, we loved the project um, because it started as sketches and it started as discussion about what it is we do. And so we would, re we would be really trying to express that. And then it, it ended with collaboration with beautiful people helping us do something quite beautiful. So that was that. Was that. <laughs> what does it say, Pablo? <laughs> Excellent. Anyway, so we've worked over a number of years with DNAD, which is the British Design and Art Directors. You guys probably have heard of it. It's probably one of the most famous and oldest awards out there. I think it started in about 1960 to celebrate the best British design or the world design and advertising. Um, so we were asked a couple of years ago to do the actual awards night, which is the big deal, which is where they hand out these yellow pencils, which is for a designer or an advertiser, it's, it's like the Oscars, you know, it's, it's this amazing thing. And we had to create a campaign uh, to get people to spend a lot of money to go to these awards. Um, we probably showed a number of ideas, and at this, the, the idea at the end of the day was the, the, these white gloves, this presenter, uh, which was kind of like a, like a Sotheby's or Christie's uh, where, you, where you buy beautiful stuff so someone was holding something gorgeous or it was a magician. So it's all about the celebration with, with, with this hand and this glove. Um, so these posters went out. If, if you were being nominated, uh, you'd get a poster with the yellow pencil or if you weren't being nominated, you were just coming along for the evening, you'd get one clapping. But it's kind of how you can take an idea and, and absolutely milk it. And Nick and I love language, so this was an envelope that you opened it up and it was the hand um, giving you the invite, which says the unholy passion, the never-ending education, the obsession with detail, the teamwork, the brainwaves, the clock turning midnight again. So it's everything that you as designers or people in industry kind of still relate to. You know, it's that tension, the anxiety and, and nervousness about a presentation or even an award. So the two things always work together with us. There's words and images. Um, and then we created um, this little viral that went out. I'll, I'll just play it for you. Thank you. 
a little film that went out. DNA D is a charity. They don't have a lot of money to pay for design work, and it's something that you have to do and just to kind of spend a lot of your own money to make something look great. It's a double-edged sword, actually, because you know everyone in the design industry is going to see this, and you want to do a really good job. Um, but not having a lot of cash to make something can be really beneficial. I'm going to show you the little movie on how we made this. Three, so this three, is actually in one, our cell um, at NB with a couple of students nice and, and this little script. And you've got the right shoes. Watch the gun on the left. One. Now. Time for a quick change. Ping. Change to us. Ping. Back again. Where's the venue? It's the roundhouse. But who's here? Look. Who's that over there? It's the big shoes. Cool. Oh, time for a chat with each other. Drink. We're doing a drink now. Ooh, I have one. I have one. I have one. Oh, the Lord. There's one. Your mate's here. One, two, three, four, five. Whoa! Oh, look at the top. Here you come to drink, guys. And there's one thing else. Okay, you're getting an angle of your drink. Oh, my God. It's pissed. Oh, 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 oh. So I, I think we think actually the making of this is just as much fun, you know, as as the final thing filmed on. That, that was just one take, so it, it worked rather well, and then we edited it. And this is in the roundhouse in Camden, and you just kind of have to do the whole building. So here we go with our little hands all over the place. We cut out all these cameras. We really made a, a job for ourselves here, actually, but, you know, it, it, it was fun. So you walked in, had all these paper cutouts everywhere, which is great. Um, the menus, got all these hands from China holding the, holding the menus and the uh, the, the, the numbers of the seat, they all got stolen, which was fun. Menus, etc., etc. And um, there's about two and a half thousand people turn up for one of these awards. And literally after about ten minutes, absolutely everybody is completely wankered. They're very drunk before they do the big ceremony. So we had to come up with a big idea to make everyone really quiet before the presenter gets up and says, you know, this is the award for this, and it's very boring, this is the award for that. So we did this. And he goes on and on and on and on. And um, for each different category, and there's about 30 of these. Actually, the typeface hasn't popped up. Um, these are the little idents for, 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 each uh, for each section. And sometimes they can be quite hard, but these ones are always the best ones to illustrate. And we didn't have to do this, but once you're on a roll, you've just got to carry on. Over to Nick. Um. Following on from that, more recently, um, DNA introduced another award, uh, a white pencil. Kind of a difficult one to get your head around because they've, they've messed with the format of this award quite a bit. But the white pencil is essentially an award for good, an award for um, uh, being ecologically sound, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so, so that was kind of a tough brief, how do we promote this thing? And we came up with, uh, the idea behind this was that it was going to be held at the Royal Institute, where scientists in London um, and from all around the world have, have, over time, released all sorts of amazing things into the world. And, and, and a lot of the scientific endeavor has come and, and started there and been, uh, been broadcast to an, an elite few there. So they were holding their event there, and they were going to call it a symposium. And we said, well, no, call it a laboratory and get everybody involved. So um, we then got loads of brains and connected them together to, uh, and, and used the white pencil as kind of like the battery to uh, make the brains work. So the imagery, <laughs> we, the imagery we came up with was, was brains connected, because at this symposium, you would come along 
and you would debate and you'd, there would be all sorts of little events. So this is the kind of imagery that we came up with. This was the invite, which is, normally this is bring your own beer, but this is bring your own brain. And uh, we, had to, we had to get all these brains delivered um, from various scientific shops in Germany, and uh, that was quite fun. So the, the kind of core imagery starts to look like this. The white pencil in the middle is kind of a, what's the word? Kickstarter for, for the event. And then the light bulb, the Pluman light bulb is one of the award-winning uh, kind of white pencil entries because it's not only beautiful, but it saves energy. So, so it's a perfect uh, idea. And I took this, I don't know whether any of you guys ever downloaded this app called Rando by our friends called Us2, but um, I took this, basically we hired all these brains from around uh, the place and bought all these brains. Some of them we had to return in good order. And because we were using colored dyes in the bottles to make this laboratory experiment, we accidentally dyed all the brains. So I think this is a beautiful image. This is me taking a photo of our sink. But I don't know, it reminds me of ice cream or something. Anyway, so on, on we go. The idea and the, and the posters that we did kind of continue, so everything connects, and we're using kind of laboratory stuff. And over on the right, you've got a kind of a debate, and they're all connected. So it was kind of, once you have an idea, like the hands or the brain, you very quick, like pre the previous ones, very quick eye dents in between speakers at, this, at these events. So I guess this is the guy from Puma speaking. And this is your tea break. I mean, it doesn't, I, I know it doesn't look like tea, but it, yeah. piss break. So, um, and, then, and then I guess the job then is to dress the, uh, the venue. So we put brains everywhere. And we used uh, laboratory kind of um, stands to hold the signage and that sort of thing. So it's just cheap fun, I guess, is what we were looking for with DNAD. Um, brains on T-shirts, lots of ways for people to uh, kind of express themselves, and then things on display. Over to Anna. <laughs> so this is a job we did a couple of years ago for the Museum of London. It's an amazing museum. Um, but no one really knows about it. It's kind of stuck in the Barbican of, in this big roundabout, but it uh, has a, a fantastic archive of absolutely everything you wanted to know about London. So they were having about <laughs> 20 million quid spent on a new gallery, um, which was going to be from 1666, and every school kid knows this in England because it's the Great Fire of London all the way up to 2012, which was when the Olympics happened. So they wanted an advertising campaign to launch the opening of these galleries. Um, th th this was one of these pitch ideas, and because Nick and I are from London, we really wanted to do it. I think they asked about 12 people to submit a, a, a written uh, pitch, and then from that, we then showed three ideas. And I thought sometimes, instead of going to the finished thought, we can show you some of the ideas on, on, on you know, some of the other thoughts that we showed as well. So we, I think we probably showed about three ideas here. Um, so this concept was called Modern Since 1666. There's always that play on words and images again. And we love the idea of a, a London bus stop with everyone from all these generations, from 1666 to present day, just queuing up. And we thought this could be quite a great, iconic image. And, you know, we thought actually you could dress people up and photograph them in the street. It could have quite a fun thing to do, um, to create posters. Um, so that was one idea. And hopefully it's going to change to another. And this was another idea. And I love the fact that you can be somewhere in London and, you know, like Barcelona, it's a very old city. And someone would have stood in exactly the same place and seen something very, very similar to what you see today. Um, so we had this kind of concept of going around London, photographing places today up against places from yesterday. 
and they seem to really love this idea. Um, and this picture particularly was photographed by a guy called Bill Brandt, very amazing photographer who took this at the Elephant and Castle during the Blitz, during the war. And we just thought actually this would be an amazing idea because the underground really hasn't changed apart from um, the posters that you could create something like this and put it as a big billboard on the other side of the platform and people could look left or right and they'd be in the same place as they would have been in about 1942. So we came up with this title called You Are Here. And this is one of the second concept we showed and, and, and they bought into it, which was great. And here it is actually in situ. So that would have been at the Elephant and Castle. And then we had a great job of working with the archivists appropriating certain sites all around London uh, for <coughs> billboards or, or for whatever. So this is outside the Bank of England. We could stick it on bus passes, oyster cards. And we had a lot of installations around London too. And th this is at Trafalgar Square. Um, so it's Emily Pankhurst in about 1901, talking about the women's rights. And once you've got this line, you are here, be here, this was the launch for the, uh, for the opening. And then we had an idea of this interactive map, um, which someone else then developed and was really successful. So this is just a little project on what we think that, you know, good ideas can actually be really, really good for business. Um, we got the, 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 the stats at the end of this, and the year before in January they had 6,500 people. They only expected 17,000 people on the launch, and on the very first day they had 35,000 people, which is, a, which is really nice to hear when, you know, a very simple idea can make that much of a difference. Number four, something completely different. Russian bank. Mexican sombreros. Um, mm. Yeah, so we've been working in Russia a bit, which is really cool uh, and, and really interesting and really out of our comfort zone. Um, this is going to be slightly different. So this is a bit of kind of an insight into the process. So generally we'll get a brief, like, like you guys will get a brief. This one was, um, this brief was kind of um, put together by Michael Wolf and the client and he, they, he pitched us against various other agencies uh, in order to win the work, so we worked hard to win the work. Um, the brief was essentially, we want to create a, a new kind of bank in Russia. And we said, why, why are we doing it now? So this is our sort of uh, way we interrogate a brief. We have a way of doing it. Um, but we asked all, all, all sorts of questions of them. And, and then we sort of engaged with them, so we went out to Yekaterinburg in Russia, and to the, the headquarters of this kind of little startup that are creating this new kind of bank. And at this point, we still didn't know what they were doing, but we knew that it was sort of digital. Um, and so they were kind of working like a miniature Google, uh, and it was just m really interesting to see a people <coughs> how, how people digitally work using the agile process and a massive learning curve. Learning Russian, really, re again, really difficult. But also how how that distance and that barrier can just shrink down when you get to know people and you realise that they're kind of similar to you and they want similar things. They, they're striving for for something really good. And it, what a wonderful project to work on. So I've been out there quite a few times. Alan's been out there as well, and um, we've worked with them live. I mean, they're very demanding. They want. Uh, kind of, uh, we've done some instant graphic design while they're sort of sitting with us, which is quite nerve-wracking because I don't like doing that anymore. Um, and sort of instant presentations to enormous teams of Russian people with a with a translator called Evgeny, um, and and it's lots of kind of live working, lots of and lots of uh, video conference calls where you're sort of trying to present work and going. It, uh, it, uh, it, so really frustrating at the same time. Um, but so we get this brief, we kind of do it in stages, we try to work out and plan how we're going to do it, and then we do it in a bit more detail, and once we've done that we know roughly how much it's going to cost, and then we say it's going to cost this much money. Um, we then work with Michael and the team to come up with uh, what would the name be for this new thing? What, would, what could this be called? So a bit of learning around what makes a successful name. You know, sometimes there, Twitter's a great name. 
uh, it, it kind of almost, the, the names that roll off the tongue, the names that become memorable are the ones that break the mold usually. So um, yeah, that's, that's one of the things we, we were trying to come up with with them in, in terms of making short lists of names. Um, we, were, we had all this information come at us, you know, uh, mostly from, uh, you know, m mostly uh, Russian information, but also around. So these, these slides are part of us playing back to the client. Yes, we understand. So we understand that you're a digital bank. We understand that you want to become the world's leading online bank. We understand that you're going to have a third space in Moscow where entrepreneurs are going to come. So this bank is for entrepreneurs, for young Russian business people. You're going to have a new kind of bank. Uh, we understand that it's going to be you know, tailored to those people. Uh, we know that you're moving away from the old bureaucratic ways of doing things into the new modern way of doing things. From bureau bureaucracy to simple, to old technology to innovation, etc. So, um, and we know that you've, you, this client has been at great pains to tell us the kind of the spirit and the personality that they want this new bank to be. So off we go, and we do a bit of research into the, and we, we play back to them, okay, we understand, we think you're talking to these kind of people, and they're talking to the entrepreneurs, they're also talking to accountants who will also use the software, because further down the brief we go, we realize that this isn't just a bank, this is a service, and they want entrepreneurs to be able to not only be able to bank with them and have their money with them, but also to be able to ring up and say, I need to order a rhinoceros, where can I find a rhinoceros? So they're going to have a, a, like a concierge service, uh, a, a PA, a personal assistant, and they're going to have legal advice as well. So all of these things wrapped up into this new thing. Um, we know that there's some competition out there, big Russian <coughs> competition. We know that there's global competition. We know that there is a, you know, Citibank are very highly regarded for their digital banks. We know that there are things like PayPal out there. We know that in Russia, people hold more money on their Starbucks card often than they have in their bank account. Uh, all sorts of strange things we're learning. But eventually we, we decide and we, we come up with short lists and we share them with the client on the name and the name we come up with is this one on the left, Konopka, uh, although it looks like Conker. Um, and Konopka means button and button is a, like a wonderful word, it's very short, it rolls off the tongue. In Russia, Konopka is a wonderful sounding word too. So Konopka can be used emotionally, uh, Konopka means cute, like cute as a button, cute little girl. Uh, but it also means, you know, action, press the button, you know, the physical button. So now we know roughly what this, the spirit of the brand should be, and, and these, these images here are kind of trying to, trying to play back what we know, what we know they love, what we know they, they're, they're quite serious Russian bankers, uh, and they know a lot about banking. However, they want to have fun too, there's some spirit to this brand. They don't want to be like the old bureaucratic banks. So we... We're at pains to show them that we understand what that means, and we start calling it a smart rebellion or something. And we show them things that we think, like, we think you mean this. The giant duck, uh, duck by the fantastic Dutch artist and this fantastic watch by Tibor Kalman. Do they capture the spirit of what you're talking about, yes or no? Um, and we try and write down what this thing is, this new type of bank. So we come up with lines like, well, it's an extremely useful business service for entrepreneurs. And these are parts of presentations that we made to <coughs> other people we knew we'd be working with. Uh, we worked with us two, who are a, a digital agency. Um, and we worked with not the London office, but the Swedish office, uh, which was great fun too. So we were traveling from London to Sweden, London to Moscow, London to Katarinaburg. And we knew that what we were going to do was going to touch all these different bits and pieces, w whether it was digital, whether it was in a physical space, that's what we're going to do. Um, and we knew that kind of the button idea was, was this activate idea. You know, it had to be something special. Anyway, uh, we also knew that iOS, Apple, was going to be flattened. The new iOS 7 wasn't going to be this kind of like toothpaste gel looking buttons. I don't know the technical term for this, but we knew that it was going to be flat. And flat graphics were, were coming back into the the operating systems of phones and that sort of thing. So, you know, this, these are inspiration boards that we were putting together for, for them. So this is part of our, our pitch. Could it look like this? Could it be like this? Very simple. Just very simple black and white. 
Could it be like this? Is it about, is it about collaboration and communication? It's a little bird. But eventually we settled on this one. So actually, in the pitch, this is what we showed them, and, uh, and this is what they liked. So we showed them all of this stuff. Um, so Knopka, kind of like Smarties, very simple, jolly, not what you expect a bank to look like. And then we showed them how flexible this could be. And we, again, showed them very quick mock-ups of how this could look. We showed them, you know, I'm at the center of this. I can drag what I need near me. We started to almost think about how their, how their applications could look. And we're starting to imagine for them, before we've really finished the design, it's still in a sort of pitch situation, really, how could this all start to look? What if Knopka was a verb? What would a billboard look like? And then we did more workshops, and the one on the left is R2-D2. <laughs> um, but would Knopka be like R2-D2? Would he be this, would Knopka be a kind of little character that could help you? And eventually we just, you know, making the toolkit uh, available to people like us too, the advertising agencies we were working with, PR people, uh, the whole thing kind of working at the same time. So um, starting to imagine, could it look like this? Could it work like this? Could you just be very simply uh, everything done in circles? No. However, it was fun while we did it. Could it look like this? Could our circles in some way be part of this? Eventually, we started getting a bit more serious and understanding the difficulties behind app design. So off we go, and we're starting to show how things might work on tablets. I think this is an animation, etc. So all of this is kind of play, but at the same time, it's moving towards iterating and iterating and iterating, making, 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 uh, and working with our client to, to move towards a kind of successful launch. Uh, and it was all done quite quickly. So these are icons that we designed. Um, then once we'd had this app, this platform, this thing that you could contact your lawyer with or your bank, or once we had this, then how do we promote it? So we, <coughs> we thought, well, go back to the Knopka little girl, you know, this cute little girl. Well, maybe we ask our friend John Julien to start to draw her for us. And that's, that's kind of what we did. And then we made her have a language, have a voice. So here she's asking, why do you work so hard? So as an entrepreneur, which I guess we are, um, but we're a bit older, um, imagine being challenged by this little girl, this little person, asking you, why are you doing it this way? Why are you working so late? Why are you doing it like that? Um, all of the questions you have in your, own in your own mind when you're frustrated about the way things happen and the way things work. Why do I have to go to the bank to sign this thing? So, this is a kind of like a campaign that we came up with, a campaign idea that we came up with when we took, um, we went to Russia again, and we went with, this time with St. Luke's, an ad agency, and we started to create this stuff together on the hoof, which means um, as we were working uh, out in Russia, very quick. So we made a website basically in a weekend. So this is what the website starts to look like. You can go there, knopka.com. Um, and this is the little girl challenging you and then we explain what the product does, and it's all translated into Russian. And it looks like this. So this is, um, and we're still working, and we're still doing stuff, and we're making things, and we're, it's great fun, and it's the most fun I've had this year, to be honest. Uh, and now we're gonna be doing something else with them, so this is just fantastic fun. Over to Alan. <laughs> Okay, this is a, a little bit shorter. I think what we love at MB is working on different projects all the time, whether it's a Russian bank or an art gallery. This is for the v and um, And they were having um, an exhibition called Uncomfortable Truths, which is a bit of a bastard of a title anyway. And it was all about commemorating or celebration of the abolition of the slave trade from about 200, 250 years ago. Um, so very, very delicate, sensitive subject, very difficult title. Um, and they were gonna commission 11 black artists from around the world to exhibit within the V&A. And I don't know if any of you guys have been to the V&A. It's an amazing, amazing museum. 
over in Kensington, this old beautiful uh, Victorian building. But it's like a kind of rabbit's warren. You're always going to get lost, but it's stuff from, you know, everywhere. It's, it's incredible. Um, and to make it even harder, the, the, all, all this art wasn't going to be in one room. It was going to be all over the place. So we had to come up with two ideas at the time, one for an iconic image, but also one um, to take you off to all these different rooms, whether it was something to do with the silver trade, or which would take you to all these sugar bowls. Um, so as I said, it's a very, very sensitive subject, and these artists were sticking all their art in, you know, all, all, all around the v &A. Um, What we like to do is, is, is we're very collaborative at NB. We, we hate all this type of not sharing or not showing. It's kind of get it up on the wall, get it on the floor, and let's work together. Nick's drawing funny little things down there. Um, and and, and if, once you've got it up there, you really know if it's going to live or breathe, if you come back the second day, and you know if it's going to be big and bold and, and works. And it's, it's a really good way for us to work. It's a very quick way to work up. Just ask your friends what you think of it. It's great. It all goes up there, you know, big arguments. Stuff comes down, things get screwed up, it goes back up there again. It's great, but it was really analysing what is this exhibition all about, uncomfortable truths. And we weren't allowed to show any imagery as well. Um, so the, these were some quick concepts. One of them was to do with arrows, to do with the slave trade, you know, all the old cliches, get it all out there. And we realised actually these are boring, there's nothing really solid here. Um, and sometimes it's quite nice to get your hands dirty again, get the inks out. And it was all about being a little bit abstract. Um, so we were messing around with these ink splats, but it didn't really mean anything. And one of the artists um, was exhibiting, exhibiting this type of work, and there was a real thing going on between the splat and the illustration. And suddenly you kind of have these little moments, and you join the two together. And I think that's what we really like, is the one plus one can equal three. And we created this little iconic image, which is great because then all the other artists then get their own little head and it also becomes a signage project as well. Um, and this was the mark to take you off to traces of the trade if you wanted to go off to the silverware department. It didn't really matter because you were going to get lost in the V&A anyway. But at the end of the day, it's creating a very simple, bold graphic, um, which could leave you pulling your hair out after about two weeks. And you actually realize it takes a lot of hard work to make something look very simple and very, very, very effortless. And, and this is how the two campaigns look together. But also, it made it a little bit more interested in the brochure work as well. So we're nearly there, number six. Over to Nick. What does this mean? My college is paradise. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and Almeida, so this is a theatre in London, but I know this, this is a Spanish word, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or a footballer, or? It's Spanish, so. Okay. Almeida, ah, okay. How do you say it? Almeida. 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 So anyway, this is a, uh, the typeface hasn't come out, so excuse the font, but um, so this is, um, Alan gets to show you the pictures, I get to show you the process behind. Um, this is a recent project, so I guess this is why I'm showing you the process behind it. There's a process behind everything. Of course. <laughs> um, so Almeida is a theatre in London, it's in Islington, it's quite a small theatre, uh, but it's got quite a good reputation for the kind of quality of the plays that it puts on, productions. Uh, <coughs> and they sent us a brief, so the brief was, we'd like you to help us encapsulate our distinctiveness, which I, can, I guess means show our, our difference. Uh, this shouldn't be just another theatre rebrand. So um, that was great. I mean, to get that kind of thing on the front cover of a brief is fantastic. So we looked at all the other theatres uh, in London, or some of the other theatres, and the ones they were talking about. So when you, we went to the meetings, we'd be... I don't know much about theatre, if I'm really honest, so I'd be, I'd be writing down the names of the theatres that they were mentioning, and I'd be looking them up and doing a bit of desk research and going out and seeing them. Um, but what we found was um, they were kind of much of a muchness. 
Um, and after a while, uh, so, so the identity of the theater, which is often a venue, which is a house, um, clashes with the identity of the production they put on, and there's, there's all that kind of um, stuff going on. And everything is kind of, there are accepted standards, uh, you know, there's a way of doing things in theater land, and that's what you're supposed to do. And then inconsistency is rife. I mean, everything, you know, is higgledy-piggledy and stuff, and that's just branding generally. Um, so what about the Armida? Well, their stuff was kind of okay-ish. It was done, this was done by Wolf Hollins, actually, the, the, the mark, and the little A's are like the theater masks. Um, so I guess that's a kind of a nice little idea. But, um, you know, they said themselves that it was looking tired, dull, elite, um, stuffy, inconsistent, erratic, uh, and departmental or show-led. So they'd already decided they were gonna change it anyway, so that was fine by me. <coughs> Um, so what is going to make them different? Well, they said in the brief, we will produce theatre red of tooth and claw. They had these sentences <coughs> in the brief that not many briefs we get have this kind of, kind of like, oh, language in them. So it was fantastic for us. So we'll produce, um, we are smart, relevant, provocative, explosive. Audiences will arrive brave and leave wrung out, flushed, surprised, soul expanded. Their experience of the Armida will be urgent, essential, truly unmissable. We will respond to, to what's going on in the world, stare at this one, and lead a future one. We are intellectually rigorous, thought-provoking, demanding, and we won't compromise. So we have this kind of, we pick out the words when we read briefs, you know, there are these words, and you pick them together, and you think, wow, that's, a, that's quite a list of words, and it doesn't, you know, Smart, relevant, provocative, intellectually rigorous, contradictory, urgent, essential. That doesn't sound like a theater. It sounds more like a newspaper. And that's kind of, that's kind of where we went with it. At the time, we were kind of admiring this kind of stuff and thinking, well, these guys, on a weekly basis, especially Bloomberg Business Week, turn out fantastic covers for things. Uh, and they are relevant, and they, are, they reflect what's going on in the world immediately. And they have this editorial speed. It's kind of like, here's the news. Wow, there's a fantastic design idea around that that we can use on the cover. You know, bam, bam, bam. Same with kind of time, same with the kind of uh, economist stuff. So we were looking at this stuff, and we were saying, you should be much more like this stuff. Um, you should be like these weekly titles. Uh, they, they're, they're relevant, thought-provoking, attention-grabbing, vital and urgent, like you say. They're rich in content, and they're fighting for attention on the newsstands. You know, they have the same job to do as your theatre does amongst all the other theatres. So. Let's take that. So how can we capture this spirit in your new identity? So we started back with the logo. So we took the word the off. We kept the word theater. Um, I haven't shown you what the previous logo looked like. Oh, I did, yeah, Almeida, yeah. So you're a venue, but you're much more than that. So Almeida Theater. And then we put it in a big, bold typeface, Almeida Theater. And it felt still, you know, is that provocative enough? <coughs> is that kind of really... So no, that's provocative. Turning the word theatre upside down is provocative. I mean, that's kind of like anti-theatre. So that's what we did. Strong, memorable, confident. A new masthead. We, you know, back to the language of, so the masthead is the, the bit on a magazine. <coughs> this is the same. We, don't call it a logo, call it a masthead. Have a new attitude, have a new spirit at the Almeida Theatre. Stuff can start to look like this. Instead of little brochures, do magazines. Every production can, can be different, and we will work with you in an editorial kind of team-like style. We'll come over and we'll, we'll work with you. And then we can make, in, in your brochures and in your things, we can make everything a bit richer. So American Psycho has just been, uh, is just on at the Armida Theatre at the moment with Doctor Who, the actor Doctor Who, so it's quite a big deal. Um, <coughs> we were saying, well, we'll help you with all this. We'll make stuff look funky. Um, and they were saying, does everything have to be so kind of in your face and provocative? And I was saying, no, well, we can do you a system. So we can do Almeida provokes, Almeida educates, Almeida inspires, Almeida projects. We can use it as a system. But you said audiences will arrive brave. So we think you should put the word theater upside down over your front door. So it's about confidence. So instead of saying, the Almeida is a 325-seat theatre in the heart of Islington, London. We're going to go, we will respond to what's going on in the world. Stare at this one and la 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 la. So, and they said, well, what about the plays that we put on? What about our productions? 
And in the brief, they asked us to sort of give an example of how we might treat one of their plays. And they sent us, they sent us a script through. And so we threw that away, read the first page, and thought, well, OK. Uh, this is what they said. They said, it's King Charles III by Mike Bartlett. It's a new play that we might produce. Um, essentially, in his first days as king, Charles refuses to sign a bill limiting freedom of the press and then must face an escalation which threatens to divide the country. Excuse the type, please. Um, and we said, look, we wouldn't normally do a brief like this. We want to work with you. We wouldn't work, uh, we wouldn't do a pitch. We wouldn't be working like this. But so we would ask all sorts of questions. Who are we talking to? What do we want them to think? What resources do we have available? How much time do we have to put this thing together? What's the single most important thing we want people to know? And why should they believe it? So we're kind of demonstrating back to them that we're not just going to go away and do stuff. We're going to challenge them. But we kind of did anyway. So um, we then said, this is kind of the way we work. So you have a central thing. You've got a problem. How do you solve it? Off you go. There's different ways of doing it. And this is kind of a, a method that we use more and more in the studio. Um, so you can go off. You can go into politics, or you can go into censorship, or you can go into specifics like the Levinson Inquiry in the UK, or you can go about monarchy in the 21st century in the future, or super injunctions, or Murdoch, who runs the newspapers. Um, but we said, as graphic designers, Themes like censorship give us very quick ideas. You know, it's that censorship. And you guys know this just as well. It's kind of like, what, think of a picture to say censorship. It's kind of like blocking people out and making things blurred. And, well, royalty, that's kind of easy to find. But there are the sort of comedy bits about royalty as well, where Prince Charles actually did the weather in the UK, read the weather out. And there's royal weddings. And there's kind of like Prince Charles over time, and when he looked kind of like quite young and Jug-eared. Um, so it, w it might look like this. What we do for you might look like that. We're not saying it's finished, but um, it could look like that. Or, or it could be like this. It could be an iPad app, and we could play with words and censorship. Or if you really want, in the middle of the night, we'll go out and we'll write the Queen is dead over Buckingham Palace <laughs> with a projector. But we really want to win this job. So, uh, and then they said, well, what about our website? And we said, well, your website kind of looks a bit dull at the moment. You need to inject the same kind of enthusiasm into that as, as, as you should do into everything else and as you are. So it could start to look like this. It could be more of a mashup. So in summary, you've got these amazing list of words. We'll stick them on the wall, and they will become our checklist. So we'll just make sure everything we do kind of pushes and is provocative and is urgent. Um, you'll have your fixed elements. We'll call your logo your masthead. We'll give you all sorts of grids and stuff, but there's going to be changeable, changeable elements, uh, the content, the words, the images, and the messages. And we're going to underpin it all with this kind of Almeida spirit, this smart, relevant, provocative. So in summary, it's going to look, look like that. And they said, OK, and we won the job, and that's the first thing we've done, and that's on at the moment at the Almeida Theatre in Islington, and it's um, going to go onto the West End because it's been very popular, and people are killing for tickets, literally. Um, and it's a musical about American psychos, which is, whoa, kind of blew my mind. And we've started to do their little program brochures as bigger magazines, and we're having sort of fun there. And then we're doing all sorts of other bits of little print, and there's a ticket for the thing, and it's fun. Again, fun. <laughs> I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so from death and daggers and murder to, uh, to babies. Um, th this was for a store called Mothercare. And Mothercare is a very famous uh, company. It's been going since about 1960 in England. See this beautiful logo, and it sells baby stuff, you know, for people with babies. And, but over the years, it had become a, a little bit tired. And all the other superstores in England, like all the grocers, were beginning to sell all this baby product. So um, they were really kind of falling behind, and they needed to, to be, um, they needed to kick up the arse, really. And they had this beautiful heritage, you always trusted Mothercare. Our parents went to Mothercare. And you look at their past, and they have some really beautiful stuff going on here that has seemed to lost, the, um, lost its way. 
Um, so we kind of came up with this mission statement with a company called St. Luke's who we worked with a couple of times, a um, big ad agency. And they wrote these lovely words for that wonderful, frustrating, hilarious, serious, exhausting, rewarding process called parenting. Mother care since 1961. Really, really lovely mission statement. So, so with this in mind, and with beautiful illustration, we commissioned Ivan Chimayev here from Chimayev Gizma, and fabulous imagery, we started to create this whole new look and feel for mother care, this big retail store, which eventually went all the way from the till receipt to the signage. What I'm going to show you here is just a tiny, tiny little bit, but it must have taken up Nick and I's life for about four years um, because there was so much. We ended up doing absolutely everything for mother care. And we'd never worked with retail before, but we realized, which is great because we came from it as a completely open mind. And what was good about it is you kind of jump on this speeding train and you just go with it. And then you jump off at the end, absolutely exhausted. But in the process, we created some lovely imagery. So the first thing we did was to do this extra service campaign. Um, and it was all about how you talk to the parent or the parent-to-be. And very simply, as we do, we use words and imagery. Um, so we've got Ivan Chimayev, who must be about 450 now. Check, check out Chimayev and Gizma is, is what Pentagram based their philosophy on in the 60s. That these, these guys were up there with the Paul Rand and the Milton Glaziers way back in the 50s. And he started to create these beautiful illustrations for each one of these certain segments. So this is online. Um, the easy way to reserve your new baby essentials or this product is available for home delivery. So it was a whole message of illustration and imagery and a language to speak to this very, very nervous parent or parent-to-be. There's a lot of anxiety when you've had a kid in. You walk into one of these stores, you have no idea what to do. And then this style of illustration and words went across absolutely everything. They produce these huge catalogues every year, which is just sell, sell, sell. So these, we, we use these to simply just to break it all up and become a little bit of peace. Moonlight, starry night, sleep tight. Growing big and tall, come and measure yourself against our wall. There she is, crying her eyes out. Poor little thing. Um, but also for a store like Mothercare, which is franchised around the world, I'm not too sure if you have them um, over in Spain, they have a thing called Points of Sour or POS, which was absolutely all over the place. They had hundreds of different colours that meant hundreds of different things. So we go into the stores, you interview all the staff, and it was a real big exercise to get rid of 50 years of absolute crap, tell them to burn it all and start again, and also to have a little bit of fun. So it was a lot of rigour to kind of create something quite simple, to create something as simple as this. And you work a lot with their in-house design team to make something like this, because they're banging shitloads of this stuff out every single day. But they wanted a really simple system. Also, they had a big problem with their photography. They're using imagery like this, you know, the white picket fence, the perfect family. Parenting is not like this at all, you know, it's absolutely unbelievable. So he said, you know, you've got to get rid of this and get a bit real. <laughs> and, you know, this is what babies is all about, you know, it's about crying, it's about shitting, it's about stickiness, it's about your whole house just being pulled to pieces, you know. <laughs> um, and they loved it. And then these type of illustrations or photography became part of this big internal campaign for all their healthcare leaflets. So we just found these. We didn't commission these. We found these somewhere. Some French dude had been taking pictures of his kid. But also, so typical response from all the girls, um, there was a high level photography as well. And you know, if you want a good baby photographer, work with the best photographer. So there was a guy called Stefano Azario from South East London. But he had a really cool name and does all the stuff for Vogue Bambini. So we got, we, we got this photographer to photograph really beautiful shots. I mean, this was taken about 10 years ago now. It still looks fresh. So this would have been behind the till saying, please pay here. And this photography was commissioned for this big signage. They had these huge out of town warehouses. Um, and instead of just saying playtime or girls' clothes, this, uh, you know, we would have said baby clothes to make babies sn snugly in mum's mouth, bedtime. They're even more beautiful when they're asleep. So there's that little kind of play in the mind, a little bit of twist and a little bit of humour. And this is how they ended up looking. 
And then we moved on from that style of illustration and moved on to some very cool photography. We also um, worked on their concept store in Oxford Street. And, you know, they've got all these fabulous catalogue covers from 1962. So we got every single one they ever did and filled out this huge atrium, which was great, you know. It kind of gave you that reassurance that Mother Care have always been here. And then we became their brand guardians and wrote all their brand books, from their brand spirit books to packaging, because, you know, they sell this franchise across the world and they needed all these little brand books. But the language had to be very simple. As graphic designers, you don't normally look at brand books. So this was a very simple one. Our core colors are fixed, but we can still play tricks. You may notice the splat, top right. Maybe that was happening at the same time as the uncomfortable truce. But, you know. <laughs> Mother Care and V&A had no idea, but still, no, still looks rather good. And also their packaging. We did everything from bottles to, to, to this type of stuff, which was fun. And then they bought this other company called ALC, and we came up with this little line of family. So I'll just shoot you through some of this stuff. Because um, we're nearly at the end now, so I don't know if you want to do it, Nick, or just no, carry, on. carry on. So when we first started, we worked with Knoll, big posh furniture company, been going since the early 30s. They came out of the Bauhaus School. Um, they were moving offices, and they had these beautiful red letters, and uh, we took them for a stroll around Clark and Well, and it was called Big Red Letter Day. And we just took them out on the street and photographed it as this invite. Christmas card created all these beautiful posters to celebrate 60 years. I mean, these were done way back in 97 now. If you ever get stuck, just illustrate the title. It's a, it's a good way around. Um, so this was designed in 1999. It was a huge AO poster um, for a calendar for the for, for the year 2000 called 21st Century Classics. And there's every single piece of furniture that Noel did. So I think there's one for every single day of the year. So it's 300. 56 pieces of furniture here. These are just little snippets of stuff. Um, this was an iconic poster we did for the Americans, which is the, the equivalent of the National Portrait Gallery coming to England. And they wanted to use one image, but we thought that was a little bit boring. So we created lots of, well, we got all their imagery <coughs> and created the United States of America. But actually, if you look closely, it looks like a little dog wagging its tail now. Um, we also used to do a lot of film posters. This was Requiem for a Dream. Painfully bad film, if you've ever seen it. But, you know, they gave us two images and we just spliced it up because the whole film was all spliced up. We did a lot of work with a Tate and we commissioned this photographer uh, to go around the Tate for about six months and it became this look and feel for Tate members, which is great. This was for Andy Warhol. This was a really good uh, exhibition, but the brief was we need a big 48-sheet poster, but the same idea had to be used for a bookmark. Um, so it took a while to get here, which is quite a simple idea in the end of the day. It was just to create one poster and Andy Warhol it. But what was good, though, we could just stick any image in here at the end of the day, and it worked that way, it worked this way, it worked as a four-sheet poster, a 48-sheet poster, or just as a single poster. Did a lot of editorial work. This is Soho House. We kicked, started all of that, which was great. We just commissioned beautiful illustration. It's quite nice doing this stuff sometimes. And um, we thought we'd stick this in as well. We get asked to do a lot of these exhibitions, and this one was for the, to celebrate London, come up with something to celebrate London. And they asked, I don't know, 20 odd designers. And we came up with um, a concept called London's Kerning which was a play on London's Burn in an old uh, playground pleaser of a nursery rhyme. And so we took the audience survey map. A clash song. Yeah, London's, London's Burn in, London, yeah, London's Kernin. So we took out all the roads. It was an absolute nightmare because it wasn't on a grid, so every single lunchtime we had to get the little magic wand out and take off another bit of a road. And we created uh, this poster, which has been quite successful. Wallpaper saw it and we turned it into a poster. Uh, a little jigsaw. We've just done one on uh, Milan recently as well. Um, every single year, actually, I'm going to let Nick talk about this one and we can finish up. Every single year. Doing Christmas cards. Yeah. 
So every year we did Christmas cards and we did some funky ones. Except every year we would get later and later and some years we skipped doing a Christmas card. So a Christmas card that we could send to clients and friends. And it got frustrating because we would always miss the deadline and we would be posting our Christmas cards out in January. So, and every year you'd have to think of a new idea. Now, the, the designer's Christmas card is like a fantastic little project, but when you're busy it's also this annoying thing that you have to do. <laughs> so um, we thought, why don't we just do, forget about Christmas and just send a celebratory, hey, it's New Year. And um, so that was the idea. And let's also make it the same thing every year. Let's make a cookie cutter template. And so let's theme this card. So that's what we've done. And so um, we call it this year. And then because we love collaborating and we love, we're not very good at drawing either. Um, we come up with ideas and then we ask illustrator friends or photographers to help us. So this particular one, you get sent out. We send this thing out and it's kind of like a limited edition print and it's contained in a folder. So the folder says, this year, and then you open it up, NB Studio and friends have created this unique and valuable print for your enjoyment. And the clue for this one, for, for us, for the copywriting, is valuable print. So the value is in the dollar bill. So we then bought um, $300 from the bank, 300 new dollars, and got a printer to center them for us. And then the printer then, and we asked four illustrator friends to um, silk screen their artwork over the top, or give us the artwork, and we would silk screen it over the top. And that's what we did. So we end up with these beautiful little kind of artworks that we send to people and say, hey, happy new year. And it was kind of a comment on, on the collapse of the economy at the time as well. So we were being a bit political. So this is a playground, another, Alan calls it a playground pleaser. But this is another little rhyme that kids say in England. And this illustrator, this mad illustrator, uh, Paul Bowers, came up with it. Milk, milk, lemonade, round the corner, chocolate's made. And so milk, milk, lemonade, round the corner, chocolate's made. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, James Joyce. And uh, uh, more subtle. Um, this, this was the year that Polaroid, we learned that Polaroid was closing its factory. So we thought, well, we'll celebrate the Polaroid. God, the Polaroid is dying. So this year we're going to send out Polaroids. So we asked four photographers to go and just, and we gave them packs of old Polaroid stock, and they went out and just photographed stuff. And we got four entirely different types of results, including lots of naked ladies. Um, this is this year. So this is at the printers at the moment. It's nearly February. <laughs> so this is Margaret Calvert, and she's responsible for all the motorway sign, all the signage, and the whole uh, uh, road traffic system of signage in Britain from the 1950s onwards. What's the title this first? Um, so, the theme this year, so the theme th that year was Polaroid, the theme this year has been predicting the future because we found loads of people, uh, uh, Isaac Asimov, uh, predicted that this year would be, all sorts of things would happen. So we were using that idea of predicting the future and we asked Margaret, who did the transport system signage in the UK, to predict the future of transport. So if you look very closely, it says, unstable. But this is an actual sign. This is a guy uh, from Germany called Jan, and he's produced this. Th they've all done something 3D for us, so then we've gone to <coughs> a photographer's studio and shot it. So he's saying, in the future, we'll all have, we will be working on robots. We'll have robots to work on robots. So this is his piece. Uh, this is another guy. He's saying that housing will be so expensive that we'll be only able to afford houses that are kind of this big. And this is a guy called Ryan Todd, and he's saying the future of food is going to be this. So that's very bizarre. So that's, that's this year's stuff. Thank you very much. Preguntas? Hay que hacerlas con el micro, al parecer. ¿Alguien? ¿Nadie? Adi, no hay preguntas. Well, I have a question. What's your favorite color? How do you two work together? How you know how how you do it? Do you all work on on the same project or do you? <laughs> well, we've like been that? doing this. We've been sketching. <laughs> um, I think Nick and I started off at Pentagram. We'd go to the pub every night, basically, and 
do freelance work and just sketch away. It's, uh, it's quite collaborative, really. And we're quite free. Someone has an idea, someone runs with it. We sketch stuff on the floor. It's just quite a natural way, I think. But there isn't a point where you split your projects, like, you we, carry on? We make sure that there's someone heading up a project because of the sake of the client. Um, without designers, but at the beginning stages, we sit around the table and bang stuff out. It's it's as collaborative as we can make it. Mm. In terms of involving all the designers, we tend to get great results from that. So we create internal competitions. You know, we have one day to come up with ideas. We put them all on the floor. Um, Alan and I are sometimes like ships in the night. He's off to Russia. I'm off to wherever. Um, that sounds quite exotic, but it's not always like that. But you know what I mean? It's kind of, sometimes it's difficult for the two of us to be in the, same, the room at the same time. But when we are, um, it's great fun. But, but you know, sometimes you can get quite engrossed in a project and someone can see something completely different just to twist it or turn it on its head. So that's quite good. Venga, nadie, nadie dice preguntas. Voy a tener que empezar a regalar cosas a cambio de preguntas. Hi guys, um, I wanted to ask you also because um, it happens to to us, I think, while running the studio, um, about uh, you probably involved in a lot of projects at the same time, and uh, they're all very demanding, and you always want to do something that's really special and uh, iconic and different and relevant, and um, but you're only human and uh, um, you can do so much. So um, I noticed this little example that you had this, this, the splashes that you had used in the V&A popped up in, I think it was Mother Care? Mother Care, yeah. Um, so, I mean, probably that was just uh, accidental, but... Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, th there you go. That's, yeah, that's the question. I mean, yeah. How much... Would you, no, it's not so much reusing, but we're sort of used to that everything has to be special and there's no possible repetition. But actually, um, sometimes, you know, if you have 15 projects going, um, uh, you know, the ideas cross and sometimes things that are interesting for one project might be interesting for the other. And probably you've thought of 50 ideas before or mm. 15 or 10 before you actually come up with the final thing. So a lot of things have come up and work and um, images have popped up and it's, just feels like um, a shame not to use some of the stuff that is rejected because it didn't work. It probably doesn't mean that it's useful for other stuff. How much do you think we can reuse the images that we create? Uh, okay, I'll go first. Um, I think it doesn't matter. I, th I, think, I think if it's a reaction to a project you're working on, then I think it's fine to raid your your kind of bottom drawer, you know, your your old ideas. And often there are things we learn on one project that we can take to another. And, and I think also this personal taste comes into stuff, like uh, designers will will do something and I'll say, can we try it in that font? You know, in that, so I don't know, I think for, for us it's kind of, it's a mishmash uh, of, of old ideas and new ideas. And we strive sometimes to break out of, of of where we are and try and do different things. You know, we force ourselves to use a different typeface, force ourselves not to ring our friend the photographer, but to ring somebody new. You know, I think that's, that's another way of looking at things is to almost force yourself to do something different each time. But inevitably, and because of the pace at which we work, you've got to come up with a solution tomorrow. So you're gonna to default to your favorite typeface, which for me is accidents grotesque. You know, it's kind of, um, so, You'll see repeats, but at the same time, hopefully, you'll see a difference, and I think that's... that's yeah, I, th I think as long as the idea is relevant for another job, there's no point just using something because you like it and it's mm -hmm. not relevant. But there's a lot of work that you generate for a certain client, for a certain projects, and what we've done in the past, I instead of just all this disappearing, is kind of capture all this and put it into a little journey book, which we then digitally print, you know, about this size, and we give it to the client. So they can see the route one, route two, route three, and all the ideas and thoughts on how you got to the final thing. And it just shows the client that you've actually done a lot of work to get to where you've got to. And they've been part of that process. 
and they love to be part of the colour and in process. It makes them feel that it's their job as well as our job at the end of the day, and, and they're quite a good little thing to, to keep. So it really depends on the job. The thing with the splat, uh, we knew it was no one was ever going to see that. So uh, it's an internal guideline. And it would have been one page out of a thousand or whatever. So. I have a, a question uh, regarding how do you uh, structure the studio. You have a, a, a graphic design team, and then you told us that you have a, a management, project management team. So how do you uh, tell them how to behave to be a bridge and not a wall for the uh, design team? Do you know what I mean? Uh, it's very simple. Both our project managers or account directors both got first on a first class honours degree in graphic design but wanted to come over, go over to the other side and become account directors. So they really understand how designers work. But we always sit with them right at the beginning of a project and go through a thing called a creative brief which we fill out all these questions and answers and get the client involved. So the client, project manager and the designer were all singing from the same song sheet before we start a job. We all know that what we mean by that colour blue for instance. So there's not them and us. There is a little bit sometimes but the, the, it's, 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 it's quite smooth generally. And it's good okay. And to be honest, they're like our client, you know, within the design studio. You know, they keep you on your toes. You know, the client didn't want that. Why are you doing that? We, uh, I mean, the other thing is we're small. We're a small studio. We're not like a giant ad agency it's where there's a the floor upstairs of people in suits. There, we're just like a f small family, really. Um, so we travel together. We do stuff together. And I guess we learn the best ways of doing things together. Um, I see copywriting is something very strong, very important hmm. in your works. And I'm, the question is, is there a copywriter inside your team or how do you do it? Because it's really in some pieces, it's a really tight work with him. I think Nick and I love advertising, you know. I think we would have both got into advertising, you know, words and images. You know, each, each when we're starting a route or a project, you know, we'll have three titles and we work down from those titles, so each route would have a big title, I suppose. That's then you are creating the titles. Well, some no, of the stuff no, you no, see no. we are, and some of the stuff we use expert copywriters. Mm. You know, we've got an address book of people that we like using, and we'll bounce ideas off them, and um, we'll do pitches with them, and we'll vol involve mm. them early on in stuff. So, um, Knopka, that's, you know, the, the naming of that was with writers. Um, all sorts of stuff we do is, with, you know, we're pitching for other projects at the moment with two different types of writers. And you get to know people and you get to know what they're like. Um, and so you, they're the people you turn to when you need a exchange of ideas. Because, I mean, we are in, we're, communi we're about communication. Graphic design isn't just about pictures. So more and more we're thinking, uh, much more early on is, is the words. Um, and... I guess in the old days we used to take a brief from a client and they would send through the copy, we'd flow in the copy and make it look beautiful. But nowadays we read the copy <coughs> and think, we can read the copy and think this doesn't make sense. You know, we challenge that because it's part of, part of the design process really. So that's why words are important and that's why copywriters are, are important as well, you know, writers, to bounce ideas off. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks and for having me. Uh, thank you. It's been great. Sorry about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> let's go have some beer. Yeah. Woo! Hurrah!